Welcome to this care collab. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, it's an Agraecom care collab. Together with Karin's Orchids, Attainable Green, and Tropical Plants, Finland. So yeah, two Agraecom Leonis right here. And the question is sometimes why? Well, let me explain. <laughs> there are two varieties of Angraecum leonis. One comes from the Comora Islands and one comes from Madagascar. I have two because I wanted to be able to grow both of them. However, there is a problem. Usually with Angraecum leonis, when they are in a seedling stage, it is very, very difficult to tell which one you have, especially if nurseries don't make it clear which one they are selling to you. Here in Europe, more often than not, they don't make it clear. So I'm going to just talk through what I believe the differences between the Comora Islands Leonis and the Madagascar Leonis. And I do not believe I have one of each on my table here. And maybe you will agree with me after I describe the differences. I'm gonna be pointing to them only because of how I bought them, not because I think one is a Comora or the other is a Madagascar, but in my head, that is how I bought them. So, this was my Madagascar one. Again, disclaimer, I believe they're both the same and we'll get to that. This one is my Comora's one. So as I point, that's what I'm going to do. I have images from a bossery in bud, and I'm going to use this image to show you the spur of an Angraecum leonis from the Comora Islands, and it is S-shaped. So unless my Angraecums don't bloom, I won't know whether I have a Madagascar one or a Comoros one. The spur of the Comora Island bloom is S-shaped, very clear and very distinct. Never mind that my bossery spur eventually goes straight. I'm just showing you the shape. Another difference is the leaf span. The Comora Islands are the larger of the two varieties. So the leaf span of the Comora Islands on a mature plant can get up to 40 centimeters. Another thing is the leaf structure. It is less fleshy, it's a bit more flimsy. It doesn't have to have any kind of substance or characteristics to store water to survive the droughts. There is also a bigger stem on the Comora Islands and Graecum Leonis. So when you're looking at mine, what do you see? If this is my Madagascar one, it has very, very fleshy leaves. Okay, it has not bloomed, but the leaves are getting marginally bigger. Compare it to what I thought was my Comoros one. The leaf span is 15 centimeters, and a Comoros one can get up to 40 centimeters. Now we can also say that these are seedlings, that's why it makes it so hard to distinguish which of the two I have. But I can already say and see that the leaf span here, let's say, this is 20 in my hand, is about 15 centimeters. Very, very rarely do Madagascar type of Angraecum leonis get beyond 20 centimeters. The Comora Islands would be 40 centimeters width. If this was a seedling still, it wouldn't try to have bloom. I have very, very fleshy leaves. I do not have a stem. Everything is compact and tight. So there's that to take into consideration as well. A Comora Islands one would have a little more spacing between the leaf apexes. So I believe this is a mature version of the Madagascar and Graecum Leonis, having bought this one first, which was a much more immature seedling at the time. But you can see how similar now the leaf size is getting. Sorry if the wind is affecting the mic. But here we are, we are now coming into a certain different size. Both leaves are fleshy and succulent-like. And I believe that without even knowing which one you have, if you, and if, if you haven't flowered one yet, because the identification is 100% certain when you flowered them based on the spur, S-shaped. The Madagascar one would be a little bit more like a comet. The spur goes back away from the flower and then curls in right at the end to face the flower again. So it is not a defined S shape at all. And that would identify a Madagascar variety. Until then, I have leaves to go by. 
and my observations in the past three years that I've had these. I do not see any difference at the moment between the two. I cannot tell you if this would have been opening its buds one after the other because the Komora variety also opens its buds sequentially. It doesn't mean that the flower spike is a sequential bloomer. It's just the buds don't open all at the same time, whereas Madagascar would open all at the same time. So if you have had a flower, that's how it is possible to identify which variety is in the collection or which variety are you buying if you're buying one that you can see in flower. In my case, my observations, my comparisons are based on the foliage and they are the same. Doesn't make the difference that this one looks smaller than that one. This one was more immature than this one. So why did my flower spike abort? I'm going to boil it down to the fact that it was a first time bloomer and it wasn't ready to bloom its, its first attempt. Until the second spike doesn't come out, I won't be able to confirm whether it's a cultural thing. Because these guys live indoors all year round. They're in my dining room. In the winter, I have them under the blurple lights, directly under the blurple lights, because they do like a lot of light, but they shouldn't be exposed to direct sunlight. So the blurple lights are, for me, a happy medium, and they are like 30 centimeters above the crown of the orchid, so it's far enough away they don't get burned. Direct sunlight? Nope. Not good. Which is a good thing because it means that these orchids do not need a lot of direct sun in order to flower. They will flower in oncidium light conditions, making it much, much easier to cultivate them at home without having to worry about not having sufficient light. I have them under the blurple lights out of a matter of convenience as well. The taller orchids don't fit there, so it's a little bit of a puzzle, and they fit nicely, and the taller orchids are a little bit further away. But in the summer, they are on humidity trays because they do like a lot of humidity, especially with the Comora Islands. If this were to be Comora Islands, they grow at 900 meters, and they have a lot of rainfall. That's why their leaves wouldn't need to be as fleshy and succulent in their structure as they are here. They don't need to store up any kind of reserves for in times of drought. If a Madagascar one, for example, has a very dry summer, it will still survive because it has these fleshy, succulent leaves. That is a difference if you were to have two that were to be compared next to each other, if the leaves look a little bit different, flimsier, not as fleshy and succulent, then that'll help identify which variety of Angraecum leonis is in the collection. As my leaves are so similar, and the apex of the leaves is so similar, the width of the mature one is coming on 20 centimeters. That to me shows me these are both from Madagascar. So the next flower spike will be the test to see if it is a cultural thing. Right now, I consider it just a maturity of the orchid thing. High humidity, I give it to both of them even though I believe I have the Madagascar one. Their summer is my winter and vice versa. So if my orchid is in active growth, it's getting fertilized. It is now in active growth again. Both of them are because this leaf is growing at a rate of knots. So there's 300 parts per million of fertilizer in the bottom. It might sound like a lot, but in this case, when it comes to Angraecums, they are hungry when they get going and I don't stop them from getting any kind of fertilizer. What I will do though, this is the fertilizer of today. Tomorrow I put in fresh RO water and I alternate. But in the summer, the trays are never, never empty. And on top of that, they live on humidity trays as well. As it is mid-April, I have not got the humidity trays full of water yet. That will come when my humidity drops down to 40, 30%, which will be around about starting June. Right now I have about a 60, 70% humidity and that's fine for them, plus the little trays. Their little microclimate is okay. But in order to make sure that they're happy, even through my hot summers, I keep my humidity tray full of water and I keep their saucer full of water as well. I don't need them to be drying out, and I love having them in the orchid top setup because angraecoid roots are notorious for not liking to be disturbed, and I believe that I can leave them in these pots for several years because you can see how the roots 
are growing out when they want to, they grow out. If they don't want to, they stay in the tray and then crawl along their space at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that very clearly. There's a root going down through there, always in contact with water. Same as here, growing down and down. And this I will show you on my other Leonis. It is a branching root system if need be, and it also extends, which is great. It's not happy to branch, but you see I've got beautiful water roots here now. This helps a lot during my summer. And then this one here, you can see that the roots are extending sometimes, and gray coats prefer to branch as opposed to extend. But in this case, it's awesome because I have start, stop, start, stop. And now a green root tip is going into the water. I do sometimes miss the surface and I make sure that my moss stays away from the base. Despite my dry climate, I am not risking any rot trying to set in into the apex here. I find that these are not hard to grow, but there is caution. I would always go with caution, especially because of their tight leaf joints. So yes, I do mist the surface, but always on the outer edge and make sure that I stay away from that stem and any ambient humidity is what's gonna take care of the rest. Now that I have them established in the orchid top and I can see roots growing down and into the water, I'm much safer not having to dabble with the, with the surface. But there are times we get up to 40 degrees Celsius with very hot winds. That's when I will give them a little bit of a respite knowing that within a couple of hours they are dry again. No direct sun. Absolutely no, no. I think maybe this could be sunburn. I would assume that, you see how, how just one drop makes me a little bit, yeah. Just wipe that off, get that evaporating quicker. I could believe that that is sunburn. It could be an insect grazing, but it could be a little bit of sunburn from two years ago when I miscalculated the angle of the sun. So no direct sun. No need, they will flower regardless. And then we'll see when the next flower spike, hopefully touch wood, I get another one, whether the non-blooming factor here is based on the maturity or lack of, of the orchid, or whether it was a cultural thing. Because this spike was trying to develop in November last year. And I thought I saw a bud was gonna start, and that would have been like beginning of January. That's how long they take to develop, but it failed. And then subsequently, stop growing so we'll have to wait and see i can't say much about that but possibly possibly others will be able to tell you because their links are in the description below and i would encourage you to if you're interested go to karin's orchids also attainable green and tropical plants finland have a look at what they have to say i know that some have bloomed theirs but not me not me if there is any interest just a quick add-on I have not had any issues with pests at all. I have one here that has two spiders, Mr. and Mrs. living in the pot in harmony. No problems at all. I'm sorry if that triggers somebody, but I like my spiders. This one has not had any spiders living in it. I have not had any pests, so I find them quite robust and thankfully I'm not having to deal with any pest issues on these ones. Doesn't mean I'm not keeping an eye out on them though, but no. Nope. A quick glance, a little once over, they've been clean. So that's just to add on in case anybody was wondering. These tight, tight leaf apexes are something that really need to be observed, watched and kept clean. If you have this orchid and you are doing videos and uploading into any kind of social media platform and you want to join in on the Care Collab initiative regarding orchids, their care in different hemispheres, climates, setups, please do feel free to leave me a comment in the comment section below. Alternatively, send me an email, which is in the description of this video. Let me know that you have one and I'll put you on the list for future updates of this beautiful, beautiful species. I love them and gray combs are very, very close to my heart. So the more that we get on to this care collab, the better. Thank you so very, very much for watching. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate those that have joined in on this care collab with me. Have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful day.
Take care and please stay safe. Bye.